Hi, everybody. This is Judy Shanley. We'll get started in just a minute. But in the meantime, um, please ensure that your microphones are on mute and um, please submit any questions that you have in the Q&A box. We also have a chat function, which is an opportunity for you to share resources and ideas. But please use the Q&A box for questions. We're going to be recording this um, session so you have access to the slides and the recording after. We'll get started in about a minute. Thank you for being here. Okay, I have 102 Central Time. So why don't we get started? And again, um, please ensure that your mics are on mute and submit any questions you have in the Q&A box. We're also using the chat as an opportunity for you to introduce yourselves and tell us where you're from and your name. Um, we're so excited to have you at this important webinar, um, Improving Transportation Access and Equity in the Chicago region. Uh, as I said, I'm Judy Shanley and I'm with the National Office of Easter Seals here in Chicago. And I am also the Easter Seals Director of the National Center for Mobility Management. I'll explain that in a minute. Um, I'll give you uh, um, our agenda is um, I'll first um, do a quick overview of our amazing panelists that we have. We have a really um, great group of professionals from the Chicago Latin area who'll be sharing work that they've been doing on the topic of equity and inclusion. And then um, we'll hear from the RTA executive director, leader nationally, Leanne Redden. Leanne will do a little introduction. And I'll provide a platform and an overview of what we've been seeing nationally as a way to um, provide a foundation for what you're going to hear in this webinar. And then um, we're going to have the presentations from the uh, Metropolitan Policy Council and the RTA and um, Ryan Peterson from McHenry County. And we'll have an opportunity for questions at the end. So um, please, again, um, put your questions in the Q&A. And if you've got resources to share, please share them through the chat. So. Um, today's speakers, I, I believe that you all have um, probably know these people, they're leaders nationally, but um, we're excited. Audrey Wenick, who is the Director of Transportation at MPC, the Metropolitan Planning Council, um, will um, lead us off and talk about a, a study that she's done in the Chicago land area that has some really important um, findings for equity and inclusion and access. She'll be followed by Heather Mullins, who's the manager of local planning for the RTA. You likely know Heather and her work with human service transportation coordination planning and of uh, the 5310 program. She'll be followed by Linda Chamberlain, also with the Regional Transportation Authority. Linda um, is on the ground mobility outreach coordinator with RTA. And so Linda will share some of the really great programs and projects that are offered by the RTA. And then Ryan Peterson will be our, our uh, pinch heater. And uh, Ryan is a transportation planner with McHenry County, the Division of Transportation. And I think this this panel represents a policy to practice because you're going to hear implications for policy that we found and Audrey has found in, in some policy work and study work that she's done. But you're also going to hear on the ground, in the field work that reflects the, the policies that Audrey will talk about. And as I said, I'm Judy Shanley and I'm with Easter Seals, which the National Office happens to be in Chicago. And um, I'm also associated with the Federal Transit Administration administration project called the National Center for Mobility Management. So um, next slide. Um, I've learned over our work at the national level that any good organization in any um, 
policy that's in practice that's reflective of the field has to have good leadership with good vision. And I think Leanne epitomizes that. So um, I'll ask Leanne if you want to do an introduction. We'd love to hear your thoughts. Well, thank you, Judy, for that very uh, gracious opening. Um, and, but I really want to thank also the panelists for joining us today. And I think this is a really important conversation. As Judy said, I'm Leanne Redden. I'm the Executive Director of the Regional Transportation Authority here in Chicago. And I'll be brief because you really want to hear from the panelists because they've got a lot more interesting stuff and, as Judy said, on the ground stuff to say. So over the past year, I think it has really become even more clear how essential public transportation is to our region. Even during the pandemic, the CTA, Metra and PACE have been providing nearly 500,000 rides each weekday, including many to essential workers, uh, many who don't have other transportation options. Um, there are people in our communities and in our region who have been hit harder by this pandemic. And we really need to make sure that they are not left behind as we move into recovering from this pandemic. So throughout the past year, we've renewed our commitment to sustaining critical transit services for the people and places who need it the most. And that includes essential workers, residents uh, with economic hardships across our region, seniors and people with disabilities. We took these people and these groups of people into account in our analysis of transit center criti transit critical need areas, uh, recent work that we've been doing. And that work was what we used to form the foundation of our recommendation for how to allocate the past round of the COVID relief funding. And so I think that's some really important work that we've been doing uh, as we sort of look to coming, getting through and coming out of this pandemic. But beyond the current crisis, the RTA is also focused on ensuring more people have access to transportation options that they need. Uh, at the RTA specifically, we offer programs uh, to reduce the costs of transit expenses through the reduced fare and free ride programs. We encourage travel independence through our mobility education programs, such as free transit orientation and travel training. You're gonna hear a little bit more about that. Uh, we also certify riders to use ADA paratransit services across the entire region. As the designated recipient of federal section 5310 funds, or as it's called enhanced mobility for seniors and individuals with disabilities, uh, we are the designated recipient for the region. We support transit related projects to increase mobility for those groups. And most recently, we've updated our human service services transportation plan to accurately identify gaps in the region's transportation system for seniors, people with disabilities and low income residents. And it also includes recommendations and strategies on how we can begin to look to address those. Today, you're gonna to hear more about that plan, uh, as well as the, the great work our partners are doing to improve transportation equity and access, and examples of improving transportation uh, improvements that you, also you locally can make in your community. So working together, I think we can continue to make progress on really this very important issue and achieve uh, a future where all residents in the Chicago region have affordable, accessible transportation options. So thanks again to you for being here, uh, the panel and everybody being engaged in this very important work. Thank you, Leanne. I, I think um, Leanne's comments really epitomize that transit isn't just getting people from point A to point B. It's so multifaceted and really integral to our lives and living inclusively in the community. So thank you for your work and, and your passion around this topic. Um, I'm going to just um, go over a little bit about um, who the National Center for Mobility Management is on the next slide. I provided a um, overview of what our center is. We're, we're funded by the Federal Transit Administration or we're a National Technical Assistance Center. And we're actually in our eighth year of existence, which is so hard to believe. And our goal really is to promote coordination and mobility management. And through um, technical assistance, we support the ability of states and regions to better coordinate services and partners to ensure that everybody has access to 
mobility and transportation because we know that without transportation and mobility you can't advance good health you can't achieve economic vitality you can't be self-sufficient um, in your community so we work across federal agencies we work a lot with the department of health and human services department of labor we've been doing a lot of work recently with housing and urban development to connect all of those audiences and their state and their grantees to transportation services. And we're operated through a partnership of the American Public Transportation Association, the Community Transportation Association of America, and my organization, with, which is Easter Seals. On the next slide, I wanted to remind you that the Fed, the Federal Transit Administration funds national centers that you all could take advantage of. The services, the technical assistance, the products, the webinars that come out of um, these national centers are free and available to you. And many have grant programs. For instance, my, pro my project, the National Center for Mobility Management, has a grant program where we provide grants to um, local communities to develop coordination and mobility management. So take advantage of that. I'm not going to go over every single center, but um, I provided the website so you can go and explore more and take advantage of the really amazing resources that these centers produce. Um, on the next slide, uh, the the I have the best job in the world, I sometimes say, because I get to see things nationally and then consider how they work at the state, at the regional and local levels. And so really, as a foundation for the discussion you'll hear, I've, I've kind of grouped the, the topics that we're seeing, the, the themes that we're seeing nationally in three areas. One is integrated in innovative services. Two is a focus on inclusion and equity. And three is invigorating the system. So in terms of the integrated and innovative services, we know that there are very modes of transportation. They're very various providers of transportation. And so what we're seeing uh, at many levels is the integration of those services. So there, there becomes a continuum of of services and the services aren't as disparate. We're not siloed who's providing the services or what type. It's a, it's a coordinated system of service delivery. And in many places, technology is advancing the ability of communities and agencies to do a continuum of service. You know, with the shared modes, the, the shared rider types that are available, you need some sort of technology base to facilitate that coordination and we're seeing that that. The second focus on inclusion and equity is really about universal design. And you'll hear um, Audrey talk about that. Universal design is the notion that you're building in a focus on transportation from the very beginning, that you're not retrofitting it. Um, thinking about inclusion and equity is not an afterthought. It's really thinking about it as you're building the system. Um, individuals with disabilities in those systems are at the table every step of the way. And um, you'll hear about those experiences in many of the programs that uh, will be discussed. And then finally, invigorating the system is really critical. Um, and it's an exciting time. You know, COVID has been devastating to the transit sector, to many of us for many reasons, but this uh, has created opportunity for us to rethink and reevaluate and redesign what we do. So on the next slide, um, I have a um, graphic that I've used uh, repeatedly, and I'm not sure if you're seeing it. I'm. For whatever reason, I'm not seeing the slides anymore. I don't know if that's. No, Judy, I think um, I don't see it either. OK, OK. Um, hmm, uh, so the, the slide, I could describe it, and I'm sure the slides will come back up. But it's a, it's a cartoon, and there's six people sitting around the table, and it looks like they're at a board meeting, some official meeting. And there are two um, charts on the, there we go. 
there's two charts on the um, wall and one of them is a profit chart and profits are declining and the other is a sales chart and the sales chart is declining. Um, and the caption reads, what if we don't change it all and something magical just happens? Well, you know, I, I think not changing is not a good thing. And I think as much as we wish magic could happen, magic isn't going to happen. We all have to be deliberative in terms of making our system more equitable, more accessible, more inclusion, more inclusive. And you'll hear that in, in the following speakers. So again, we welcome you to this um, important discussion and we'll have time for Q&A at the end. And this will be recorded. So you'll have access to the slides slides and the content. So on the next slide, I will turn it over to a great colleague and a, a really great friend, Audrey Wenick from Metropolitan Planning Council. Audrey? Yeah, thanks so much, Judy. Uh, I am very excited to be here today to talk about a topic that is very important to the Metropolitan Planning Council. Um, in December 2019, MPC released a report called Toward Universal Mobility, which addressed many of the same issues as the RTA Human Services Transportation Plan that you're gonna hear a lot about today. Um, as the MPC delved into this issue, it became clear to us that just about everybody is going to face disability at some point during their life, either themselves or as a caregiver. And people may experience mobility issues as they age, but this can also come much sooner in life with a metal di medical diagnosis or serious injury. And this is really an issue that affects everyone. And that we need to look at our transportation system more holistically. We need to make sure that not only do the transit systems work for everyone, but that all the supporting elements are in place from sidewalks to signs to online information. And our research approach was very centered on the user experience. We interviewed more than 100 people to get input on what the barriers and potential solutions were. And I just want to share a few of the stories of these people to center our conversation on the user experience. Their stories showed both the extent to which public transit is a lifeline and highlights the gaps that keep it from working as well as it could. For example, um, Vicki in the top left, um, she, is, uh, she was diagnosed with a mobility disorder in midlife. Now her body is much weaker than it used to be, so she needs to minimize walking and needs escalators and elevators to get to the metro platforms to commute to work. Michelle in the lower left has used a wheelchair since she was in, injured in a car crash uh, in college. She's a financial professional who lives in the West Loop, and she depends on the CTA bus line that gets her to work daily, but laments that not all CT stations are accessible. Jamal is blind and uses PACE buses all the time to get around the region. Saturday bus service, weekend bus service is really important to him. Andrew, who's on the top, uh, center uh, top left in the white shirt. Um, Andrew lost his, lost his sight in midlife, but is still able to work as a successful lawyer and commute downtown via Metra. Audible signs are a big deal for him. Kathy uh, on the top with the wearing a hood, she has cognitive disabilities and is able to live in a group home and get to her vocational work program via PACE buses. So transit allows her to lead an active and independent life. And then on the top right, Andre uses a wheelchair after being a victim of gun violence in his teens. He's an entrepreneur, often on uh, tight deadlines and uh, needs to get around the region uh, quickly. And then lastly, but absolutely not least, Adam uh, has played a large role in both this plan and is a great spokesperson throughout the region. He uses a wheelchair and he moved to Chicago from a uh, more rural area in order to live in an urban environment where he would have those transportation amenities so he could get around uh, using transit and the taxi access program. So we're so glad that these folks shared their stories with us. Um, and now let me talk a little bit about um, the concept of universal mobility that Judy already teased it on the next slide. Um, we'll, we, we'll show how we looked at this concept for our study and think it really applies to uh, everything we're doing at the transportation system. 
So you may have heard of the term universal design, especially if anyone has gone to architecture school, you'll know it. Um, and this is designing an environment that can be accessed, understood, and used by all people, really regardless of age or disability. There's another concept called community mobility used by the occupational therapy community and acknowledges that transportation enables participation in society and allows people to do what they need to do. Uh, and we arrived at the term universal mobility based on the belief that mobility is a human right and that access to high quality accessible transportation for people all, of all ages and abilities is fundamental to accessing that right. So if we look at the, new, the next slide, uh, how many people are affected by these issues? Well, the RTA report is, has excellent statistics that I know we'll be talking about shortly, um, but to sum it up, we are getting older. The average age of the population is forecast to increase. The likelihood of disability increases with age. And already over age 65, one third of people have a mobility disability. So it's not only about aging, it's about creating a system that works for everyone at all phases of life and can it accommodate unexpected changes such as the onset of disability or injury that can happen at any age. So just think about how much mobility or the lack of it impacts people's ability to engage in a satisfying and productive life. On the next slide, I wanted to highlight um, how we need to do our planning starting with human beings at the center. We need to think about the user experience. And this is frankly not something that the transportation sector has been great at doing. Often the primary focus is on operations. How do we get the buses around the system on a certain schedule? Uh, but there are many more dimensions to people's experience using transportation and how they make their choices. We need to spend time understanding how people access and use our transportation systems and acknowledge that barriers are real and need to be addressed. What doesn't work for people? How do we provide people with good, timely, accurate information? Um, in this picture, uh, you know, is this, could this woman be waiting for a paratransit ride uh, using the new PACE software that's being upgraded that will tell her where her vehicle is on her cell phone, just like if she took Lyft and Uber? That had not been the case for a long time, and uh, we're now really happy that those types of transitions are in process so that people with disabilities have that same uh, user experience as everyone else. If we look at the next slide, uh, we also learned in our universal mobility study, uh, this, this came out loud and clear that the system has to interact in a uh, complete and constructive way. Transportation is more than just the bus. It's everything between your door and your seat on the vehicle. And this is an actual photo that we took during our study, uh, and we call it the bus stop island. While PACE has gone great, to great effort and, and CTA too, to have buses that can accommodate wheelchairs, every bus has a ramp on it. Uh, and this case, there is a shelter and a concrete pad, but you can see there are no sidewalks anywhere here. So nobody with a, using a wheelchair could use this bus stop. Uh, so this is not really providing meaningful universal access. In fact, we conducted a data analysis of every PACE bus stop in the region and the surrounding sidewalks, and we found that only 10% of PACE bus stops have a complete sidewalk network on both sides of the street within a quarter mile. There's fractured service all over the region. So as a region, we want fixed route transit to be an appealing option, something that works for everyone at all life stages. And we challenge everyone here to try to think more holistically about what users need. Too often, the conversation is very fragmented. Pace owns the buses, the town owns the sidewalks, IDOT owns the street, and we can't make the developers do anything different if they're already adhering to the zoning. We need to urgently find integrated solutions to make our system work better for people. There are also, if we look at the next slide, uh, there's also a very close relationship be between development patterns and transportation choices. There are places in our region where there's little to no fixed route transit service, and that's highly related to how we develop our land and, and how dense the development is. There may be few sidewalks, destinations may be far apart, the question we have to ask is, if you can't drive, can you live here? How can we make communities livable for people of all ages and abilities? 
on the next slide, we show uh, you know, a couple real life situations that people do experience. People trying to walk and there's no sidewalk, uh, people in wheelchairs uh, trying to cross the street and there's no cross crossing location or there's no sidewalks. Um, and we need to acknowledge that people are gonna make the decisions that feel safe and comfortable to them and that provide reliability and that are affordable. So how can we do a better job of prioritizing those types of investments in our region? It's gonna take a very collaborative process and we need to have everyone here embrace the possibilities to improve mobility for everyone in this region. The top recommendation in MPC's Universal Mobility Report and also a top recommendation in the RTA report that you're gonna hear more about is coordination among services. And Judy also <laughs> highlighted this a lot. As you see in this graphic, the mobility landscape is very complex and we already spent a lot of money on it. We need to use those resources better and to collaborate and coordinate more to leverage the system we have better. And then this is my uh, last slide, is this quote was, is a really powerful quote. This is Andrew, he's one of the people whose picture I showed at the beginning, uh, he's the architect. And he acknowledged that um, people with disabilities wanna live full lives. And we need to unleash the power of the disability community to tell their stories and guide us on the path of change. As we've been talking to people with disabilities, we have been stunned by the often simple but game-changing ideas they have to improve mobility. There's no substitute for people who know the system inside and out. We need to include them, partner with them, tell their stories, and continue to upgrade our system to get closer to universal mobility. The opportunity is right before us to greatly improve the quality of life for a large number of people in our region. So I hope you'll join all of us in working on that. Thank you. Thank you, Audrey. Um, really powerful. And, and I think the emphasis on the research and the data is critical, but the what you talked about in terms of engaging um, individuals with lived experience is equally as powerful. So thank you. Thank you for your work. Next, we're going to be hearing from Heather Mullins. Heather, again, is the manager of local planning and program management for the RTA. And you'll be hearing about, um, as we have both, um, Audrey and I have both alluded to the human service transportation study and plans for the future. So I'll turn it over to Heather. Great. Thank you, Judy. Um, again, I'm going to walk everyone through um, the human services transportation plan that we uh, recently completed at the RTA. Uh, so what is a human services transportation plan? Uh, it identifies the transportation needs of individuals with disabilities, seniors, and people with low incomes. It also provides strategies for meeting those local needs and helps to prioritize transportation services and projects for funding and implementation. Uh, and why do we have a human services transportation plan, also referred to uh, a little more quickly as the HSTP? Uh, the FTA, the Federal Transit Administration, requires that projects selected for funding under the Section 5310 program be included in a locally developed, coordinated public transit human services transportation plan, and that that plan be developed and approved through a process that included participation by seniors, people with disabilities, representatives of public, private, and nonprofit transportation, and human services providers, and other members of the public. So the RTA originally created and adopted an HSTP plan back in 2007, and then updated that plan again in 2013 to help bring it more in line with new regulations that at the time were enacted under uh, the Federal Transportation Bill, MAP 21. And in an effort to keep the HSTP in line with current trends and needs, we initiated another update in April of 2020. So what is the Section 5310 program that I've referenced? Uh, the Section 5310 program is a formula, formula grant program um, overseen by the Federal Transit Administration that provides assistance to public transportation projects that focus on enhancing mobility for seniors and individuals with disabilities. And the RTA has administered this program as well as sub several similar federal programs since 2006. And we became the designated recipient for Section 5310 uh, funding along with the Illinois Department of Transportation in 2013. So as a co-designated recipient, 
of the Section 5310 program, the RTA awards and administrators and administers eligible operating, mobility management, capital improvement projects, and associated administrative ex expenses, while IDOT takes on the responsibility of awarding and administering grants for paratransit vehicles. Next slide. So this is just a, a high level overview of our timeline for this project. We kicked things off in April of, of last year and through the spring uh, uh, engaged in our stakeholder outreach, uh, inventoried services, uh, completed a demographic analysis, identified needs and gaps. Moving into the summer and around July of last year, we started to develop our goals and strategies, um, looking at policies through the end of the year. Um, where we had uh, our draft final plan that was available late 2020, uh, late 2020 and early 2021. Um, we opened that up for a public comment period in early February. And right now we're going through um, our approval process. Uh, we'll be bringing the plan to our board next, uh, next week, I believe, or two weeks and hoping for adoption at that point. Next slide. Uh, so this slide is just an overview of the um, project advisory committee that we had overseeing this whole plan. Uh, we cast a pretty wide net. We had about 50 participants at each meeting that we held, um, including representatives from municipalities, counties, service boards, human service agencies, uh, advocate organizations, as well as private providers. And just a quick overview of the stakeholder and public input that we um, conducted as part of the study. Uh, we held over 40 key stakeholder interviews with uh, transportation providers, government representatives, human service agency representatives, as well as advocates. Uh, and I'll add that this was all done virtually. Uh, we kicked off this process in April of 2020 when the pandemic was getting underway. So we were able to do everything uh, uh, virtually. Uh, we also did some electronic surveys. We had 350 completed surveys from members of the public. We had about 180 surveys from drivers, uh, 34 surveys from representatives from health and economic organizations. Uh, we also had four meetings uh, approximately with our project advisory committee. Uh, we also conducted a series of virtual focus groups. Uh, we held two meetings in each county with one meeting in Cook County and then two regional meetings that could be attended by anyone um, in the region. We had a total of 13 meetings with about 130 attendees total, um, averaging about 10 people per meeting. We were able to, to get into more details on topics like mobility needs and medical wellness needs. And we're also able to get into um, more discussion on what some of the needs and challenges are in our region and what some of those solutions might look like. We also conducted a demographic, de demographic analysis where we looked at the propensity for transit use um, using senior and poverty rates, looking at population, employment and income forecasts, uh, looking at veteran, minority, and disability incidents by county, and, and developing indicators for higher need for public transit and human service transportation. We also conducted a, a service inventory, uh, and by doing this, it helped us to understand the geographic coverage and looking at potential gaps with current service, uh, looking at service availability during weekdays, evenings, and on the weekends. Uh, looking at a variety of regional municipal services by type that will help support um, the diversity of riders, um, and also able to identify any overlaps um, and ability to share services or features or help to consolidate um, functions among the various service providers. So uh, next slide, uh, we took all of those inputs and developed what we are calling uh, the existing as well as emerging mobility needs and service gaps among these populations. Uh, we were able to narrow that down to seven categories which are detailed um, on the slide here. Uh, quickly, there are the Pace Township co-sponsored services, Pace sponsored communications, municipal, municipal sponsored services, travel, chain, tra travel training challenges, information challenges, uh, underserved or unserved areas and populations and human service agency client transportation programs. Uh, we then had members of our project advisory committee rank um, the priority for each of these areas. 
And that's what you'll see on the slide as well. And taking those seven um, areas of need, we developed nine different recommendations to help meet those needs. Um, I'm gonna go through each one of these on the, the following slides. Um, there's, there's nine of them, so I don't wanna spend too much time on each one, but I wanna focus on uh, what the objective of, is of each of them and maybe get into a little more detail on what we're doing to achieve that objective. Um, but if anyone has any more detailed questions, we can get to that at the Q&A. So the first goal is to establish mobility management travel training networks. And you heard Audrey and um, uh, Judy talk about that in their, their portions of the presentation. Um, what we're looking for here is to provide a, a regionally supported and coordinated network of full-time county mobility managers um, that perhaps are overseen by a, a one regional mobility manager. Um, and also to help build on existing travel training um, education. Um, this is something we're really pushing for our Section 5310 program, and we've pushing that for a while. We have money that's available to fund a mobility management position at all the counties. Um, we think that's something that might help um, with some of these county level services that are being operated to help look at um, expanding service and um, areas of service and things like that. Um, the RTA is actually currently investigating the potential for the RTA to serve in that regional mobility management role. And that's something that we're going to be taking a look at what might that look like, um, what the needs are for that over the next year or so and have a decision on that. The next slide. Uh, the second goal is to expand service areas and hours. This is looking at expanding point-to-point -point services, extending service boundaries, hours of operation, and looking at needs-based transportation planning. Uh, the overarching goal here is to bring more service to seniors and people with disabilities. Um, again, this is something that we're really targeting with our Section 5310 program um, and looking at some of the existing operating services and looking to um, move those kind of to the next level and potentially identify if there's new services that are needed. The next slide. The third goal is to coordinate fair media and implement capped fares. Um, this is looking at implementing capped fares for inter and intra-county dial ride and demand response trips, which um, can be a little more um, expensive if there's a transfer involved or it's a more distance-based um, fare on that. Uh, but also to implement a shared or common fair media for all providers in the region and potentially looking at um, Ventra use, um, which is currently being investigated for ADA paratransit. Um, and I, I think Audrey touched on this a bit herself and that the RTA and PACE are currently working um, with CTA to incorporate Ventra for paratransit service. Um, what this is recommending is to expanding that to look also at dial ride customers, um, kind of going above and beyond what the, the current investigation is. Uh, this is more of a long-term um, look. It could be, um, a little more pricey to look at and, and take some time to get there. But in the end, it would be really quite rewarding for these types of riders. Uh, goal four is coordinated volunteer driver support programs. Um, this can help provide long distance evening weekend trip options um, using volunteer drivers that can be a bit more cost effective, especially in more rural areas or looking at after normal um, operating hours. It's something that I don't think um, exists to any great extent in our region, but this is a possibility. A goal five is to improve access to jobs for people with low incomes. And this is really looking at the land use element, um, looking at transit oriented development, perhaps looking at a micro transit study uh, for reverse commuters, building on existing bike share and scooter services. Um, a lot of this is already underway in our region through um, the RTA's community planning program, as well as our access to transit program, and some of the mobility pilots we've been looking into, as well as CMAP's uh, local technical assistance program. And this goal really uh, reinforces what we're doing, but also making the push to do a little bit more. Uh, goal six is to, for IDOT to expand their consolidated vehicle procurement program to include um, a few different vehicle types. Um, right now, a lot of the providers um, get their vehicles through this program, and there might be a need for maybe some smaller vehicles um, and to kind of right size what these vehicles, um, what they are, especially with COVID. Um, they're only allowing one 
uh, passenger per vehicle, and perhaps we don't need such large vehicles um, to transport people. Uh, goal seven is to explore collaboration or consolidation of similar services. Uh, and this is looking at the potential to collaborate among municipal or county-led transportation programs and looking for uh, the potential to collaborate among agencies serving individuals with de developmental disabilities, which are primarily human service agencies. Um, this is something that um, we think mobility manager tie back into the mobility management that a, a county level mobility manager could take on this work. Um, and also there have been several human service agencies that we support with section 5310 that have expressed interest in uh, conducting studies to see if it's, there's a potential for their agencies to coordinate services um, amongst themselves and perhaps look for some efficiencies. Uh, goal eight is to establish a regional one call, one click uh, service. And this is really uh, like a one-stop shop to access a central um, repository of services either um, that you can access by phone or access via a mobile device. Uh, this is something that exists in a lot of metropolitan areas in our country, but does not uh, currently exist in, in our area. Um, again, this is something that's more of a, a bigger lift, but we think the, the ultimate benefit of this um, perhaps is worth that. Uh, goal nine is to create an accessibility infrastructure database, um, looking at providing older adults or individuals with disabilities with um, more detailed information about what their, perhaps their path of travel looks like for accessing transit. Um, something like this currently doesn't exist in our region. We think it could have um, um, positive effect on um, people with disabilities, especially when they're trying to access transit. And I'm thinking of the, uh, the bus stop island that Audrey was showing in one of her slides. Um, being able to know ahead of time that perhaps you can't access that with a wheelchair um, could be helpful. And next slide. Uh, so that's all nine of our goals. So looking forward to implementation, uh, we really view this as a regional document that includes many implementers. Um, the RTA's most applicable tool is the Section 5310 program that I've been referencing throughout the presentation. Uh, we do have a call for projects that is coming up later this month um, and applications will be focusing on recommendations that support uh, the HSTP plan. Uh, we think the majority of these goals could potentially be supported with funding from the Section 5310 program. Uh, we believe the majority of the applications we'll get, and what we're, we're hoping we're getting, will support um, like three of these, um, these goals, and that's looking at the mobility management, um, expanding service areas and hours, and also the goal that looks at collaboration and consolidation of similar services. So we're expecting to get a lot of applications focusing on those areas and those elements. A little more detail on the call for projects that we have. Um, this is for federal funding from FY 2020 and 2021. It's a two year cycle. We do a call for projects every other year. Uh, we currently have about 9.5 million in funding available. Um, the call opens March 22nd with applications due April 22nd. Uh, we'll use the summer to go through our application um, review and selection process. And our plan is to go to the board for approval of our program of projects um, in August of this year. And that is it for me, thank you. Thank you, Heather, so much. I think um, I was so excited by the recommendations that came out of your study, and, and I think they really epitomized what I was talking about, about invigorating the system and really looking at what you're doing and, and redesigning what you're doing to really align with the needs of customers. So thank you for your work. Um, next, we'll be going to uh, Ms. Linda Chamberlain. Um, a lot of this, um, what we've learned at the National Center for Mobility Management is that people may not be aware of the services that are, are available to them. And over my time in Chicago, I've learned a great deal about the RTA and the services that they do have. And Linda leads a lot of that work. So Linda, I'll turn it over to you to share um, some about your work. Okay, thank you, Judy. Um, Judy mentioned earlier that uh, we are kind of the feet on the ground. Uh, we're actually, we are. We are an education arm. We are 
and outreach arms. So we are um, mobility outreach coordinators here at the RTA. And what we do is we reach out, go out to the public. Uh, prior to COVID, we were doing this in person. During COVID, we're doing it online, but we are doing our outreach and presentations so that folks really know what's happening, um, what's available to them, how they can get around, um, you know, cheaper than driving a car, um, what's accessible out there for them, what does accessibility mean? So we really reach out to older adults and people with disabilities um, to help them learn more about our transit system here in the Chicago area. Next slide, please. Some of the topics that we talk about, we've got a variety of topics. Our presentations uh, tend to last anywhere from a half hour to an hour. Some folks want to hear everything that we have, all topics that we have available. Some folks only want to hear a few. Um, some want to put it together as, you know, we'll talk about this the first time you come out and the second time we'll talk about other topics and split it up. The first, one of the first things we do talk about is our travel training program. So we have a region-wide travel training program. We have travel trainers that are available to come out and help people learn one-on-one -on -one how to use public transit, how to plan out their trips, how to pay for their trips, uh, what, it, what it's like to get on public transit. And this is really geared towards folks who want to travel independently, but maybe aren't comfortable doing so quite yet. So they can sign up for our travel training. This tends to be a very popular topic with our transition students. Um, next slide. We also talk about accessibility features because not everyone is aware on public transit, whether that's our trains or our buses, uh, that we do have these accessible features on all um, transit modes. So we, we can talk about, hey, what does that lift look like? And what would that be like for me to ride that? Or uh, what does it, how am I gonna know if I cannot hear the announcements? How am I gonna know when my stop's coming up? Well, we have visual announcements, we have audio announcements, we have um, mobility, um, we have mobility aids to get up and on to the vehicles. Um, so we, we talk about this. Okay, next slide. One of the most important things is uh, being able to plan out trips. So we talk to our audiences about how this can be accomplished. A lot of folks, there's a lot of different ways to do this. So it can be, hey, paper map and schedule. We can, we can actually talk people through this as well and, and work with them on that. Some folks like to get online. Uh, so we'll talk about what's available online and show them a demonstration of RTA's trip planner. We talk about how to download on our cell phones apps that can help out, uh, free apps that are downloads. Uh, how to use, you can use Google Maps too. It's whatever you're comfortable with. But um, in order to get around, get around safely and kind of have a plan, uh, we encourage people to plan out their trips and we can actually show them how to do this. Okay, next slide. One of my favorite topics is how to ride. So with our transition programs, and when I say transition programs, I'm talking about uh, young adults with disabilities. They're coming out of high school. They're maybe 18 to 24-ish uh, in that area and kind of really learning how to navigate um, their adult life. So uh, they may not have ever been on a bus or train. So what's that going to look like? Might be a little scary if you've never been on one. Um, or maybe they haven't been on very much. So uh, we actually will walk them through what it's like to get on a CTA or a PACE bus or the L train um, or Metro trains. Uh, the kids really enjoy this. Uh, we, we like this segment too. So it's really kind of a fun thing to, to look at. Okay, next slide. The other options that we have to talk about is, hey, how to pay our fare. Uh, our fare programs, which are our discount programs. So it's our reduced fare and ride free programs. And we talk about how people can apply for them. We um, also can actually, when we're doing in-person, which we're not, that's on hold right now because we're doing this all online due to COVID. But when we're in-person, we can actually help afterwards. So we can stay after the presentation and 
we've got our computers right there. We can help people right on the spot apply for those. Um, we also talk about safety and what that looks like. People inevitably will ask us uh, whether we have this on the, on the agenda or not about the safety of public transit. So um, we do uh, talk about this for folks who are interested in that subject, uh, but good topic to have. We also, we know, well, Chicago has a lot of fixed route buses, right? As, as we get out further into the suburbs, those aren't as available. We have less fixed route buses and train service. So what are my options? Let's say I live on, well, one of my areas is uh, McHenry County. So if I live out in McHenry County, how am I going to get around? Because I'm really not near uh, the, the 550, I think it is. Uh, I'm not near that bus. So how am I going to do that? So we talk about local options, whether that's uh, their local dial ride, their, um, maybe there's an on-demand, a pace on-demand service. And we talk about what are the differences between these and how they can connect with those services. Uh, lastly, we'll also uh, give information about our ADA paratransit program, how they get certified for that, and what that looks like um, for the rider. Next slide. So this is our uh, fearless team. This is our outreach team. Uh, at the moment, we've got our fearless leader, uh, Felicia Barbie. She is our manager. We have Ms. Sarah Blair, Candace, uh, Candace Jones, and myself. And uh, we welcome you to reach out to us at any time. Thank you, Linda. You know, when I think of a mobility manager, I think of you because a mobility manager is really somebody that knows the services that are available in a community, knows the needs that various riders have and matches those two. And you're a problem solver. And so I think um, you're a good example of what a mobility manager looks like in a community, a really go-to person. Um, next, I'd like to introduce Mr. Ryan Peterson. Ryan's a transportation planner in McHenry County. And Ryan, I think I misspoke when I and I first introduced you. I don't have my baseball hat on, but um, I introduced you as a pitch hitter. And I don't think you're the pitch hitter. I think you're the cleanup hitter. I think you're the cleanup hitter because you're, you're going to get us home and and your work really is on the ground and implementing implementing some of the things that we've heard so i'll turn it over to you and i apologize you're our cleanup hitter ryan <laughs> thank you so much judy as judy mentioned my name is ryan peterson i'm a transportation planner for the McHenry county division of transportation i'm very excited today to be talking about our mc ride dial -a ride program so let's jump right in so to begin with, I wanna talk a little bit about what the basics of our program are uh, for those who might be unaware of the program. So first and foremost, MC Ride is a paratransit uh, transportation service that allows those with mobility issues or low mobility, uh, physical or cognitive disabilities, the opportunity to travel around their communities. Uh, for so many others, they enjoy using MC Ride because it's a cost-effective, convenient, and efficient on-demand service. It also represents a community amenity uh, that helps seniors age in place, allows low-income individuals to not have to purchase a car, um, but ultimately it fills a gap where transportation options are lacking. And finally, uh, MC Ride is a perfect example of a community partnership as MCDOT works alongside Pace Suburban Bus to operate the service and benefits greatly from the Section 5310 funds provided by the RTA. So the next slide will show the uh, brief timeline of the MC Ride program. The program was created in 2010 actually as a pilot program and after gaining popularity, it became a permanent program. In 2015, the program added several new municipalities and townships to the program, greatly increasing the coverage area. In 2017, PACE assisted in adding taxis to the program, which are utilized for longer trips and service on Sundays. And just a few months ago in January, the program went countywide allowing for thousands of new residents to access the program. And the next slide will show the program funding and expenses. So the chart on the left shows the uh, funding contributions to the program. PACE contributes the highest annual amount at about 50%, followed by the RTA grant accounting for approximately 28%. Local funding is about 16% and then fare collection at about uh, 6%. The graph on the right shows the primary expenses for the program. Uh, since buses comprise the majority of the trips taken on the service, they carry the bulk of the expenses. 
Tax needs account for about 18% of the total expenses. And then finally, the call center um, and the services there represent about 1% of program expenses. Uh, the map on the left here shows the previous coverage area um, prior to January 2021. Um, in 2018, 2019, and 2020, the program averaged about 94,800 annual riders. Since 2010, the program has given four, uh, 400,000, uh, just over 481,234 rides to seniors over the age of 60 and or individual with disabilities. And since 2010, 8,734 different people have uh, taken rides on the MC Ride program. And so the next slide will show our current coverage area, which is greatly expanded. Um, so we've expanded not only to our county borders, but a little bit past that and have included uh, seven destination points outside of the county where our riders can start or end rides or end their rides from. And so with this expansion, a lot of new people have uh, now have access to the program. So specifically uh, over 146,000 residents of which about 22,600 sen are senior citizens now have access to the program. And an additional 7,687 households with at least one person with a disability and 2,051 households under the poverty level now have access to the program, which is truly phenomenal. So this chart uh, shows our ridership. And so just like every other transit provider, uh, we did take a hit um, during the pandemic, but it's important to note that we did uh, require only one person per bus at a time um, since last April. Uh, we have seen some slight rebounds in ridership uh, since implementing our program expansion. Uh, and we're hoping to see uh, increases as the months go on and as we return to full capacity as well. So along with the program expansion, we've done a number of different rebranding efforts. Our Public Transportation Advisory Committee helped us create a new logo for the program. We've created a new rider's guide and brochure to help our, both our existing riders and new riders learn more about the program updates. And then we've also created a three-part video series to help visualize some of the changes that which we posted on our new social media pages. And then the second tool um, that we've created is an MC Ride interactive map. This is a free map uh, using RGS online that allows uh, riders to determine whether or not their destination and origin points are within the coverage area. It also gives information about different transit options uh, to see if there's a more efficient and cost-effective way to travel uh, rather than on MC Ride. And so the program expansion and rebranding aren't the only uh, you know, kind of future endeavors that we have on our horizon. Uh, eventually we'd like to have a mobile application for both payments and scheduling. We'd like to introduce some kind of rewards program uh, to incentivize new riders to uh, enjoy MC Ride, but also uh, give some uh, rewards to our current riders. Similar to how Metra has the 10 ride pass, the monthly pass, we would like to create some kind of membership program like that as well. And then finally, um, potentially electrifying our vehicles uh, so that the miles we are traveling, uh, they're done more sustainably and more environmentally friendly. Uh, and with that, I wanna thank you all for uh, uh, attending today's webinar. And I think we're gonna go to questions. Sure are, thank you. You did hit us home. Thank you, Ryan. Um, one thing I just wanted to note in the presentation and the strategies that McHenry is using, you're using something called universal design for learning. We've heard about universal design, which is the architectural accessibility, but what McHenry is doing is you're reaching out to people to inform them in various ways, recognizing that people learn and acquire information um, in various ways. And so um, I applaud you for that. And I also thought as you were presenting those data about riders, the number of rides that people are um, taking on your service, that what if you asked people the question of how that ride impacted upon their access to health care. Are health outcomes any different? How did it impact upon their ability to get jobs and to keep jobs? How did it impact upon their ability to get food and access good nutritious food? So all of those kind of outcomes variables, I would love to see those kind of data to further support your innovation and creativity. Um, 
Thank you, thank you all panelists. And um, as a reminder, if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A chat. And if you have to leave before the end of um, the question and answer session, we are going to be sending you an evaluation survey. Our TA is really committed to collecting feedback. So as we do future webinars or as they do future webinars, we'll be able to take the input you've provided regarding your experience on this webinar incorporated to improve. So I see we have some questions. Thank you for that. Um, the first one is from Carrie, Carrie Ward. And Carrie's asking about how, and this I guess is a question for Heather. Um, Heather, um, how are you connecting your human services transportation plan to funding specific for individuals with low income? Um, they don't have a disability and may not be a senior, but are um, those individuals with low income? Yeah, that's a that's a good question. I, I speak a lot more towards the people with disabilities and the seniors aspect because we do um, oversee the Section 5310 program. We do have quite a bit of money that can address those needs. Uh, but the low income question, um, I think, is something that we'll be looking into as part of the implementation of this plan. Uh, but there's also work that's already ongoing at the RTA as well as with all of our service boards. Uh, specifically looking at this issue. So it's not something that's new that we've identified. Um, it's something that's um, integral with a lot of the work that we're already doing. Um, I think that is at the level of service planning to make sure we can get workers the jobs, but also looking at that land use piece to make sure that we are uh, putting the jobs where the workers are um, and perhaps uh, lessening that, um, that need on the transportation. Yeah, one of the, um, I mentioned our work with HUD, Housing and Urban Development, we're working with these centers around the country called Envision Centers, which are sort of a one-stop shop for people and many of the individuals accessing the Envision Centers are those with low income. We Many of the Envision Centers are located in public housing um, units and pub public housing properties around the country. So we're ensuring that we're engaging that audience. So good question. Um, the second question is, why is RTA looking at funding a travel trainer within each county, as opposed to having multiple RTA staff um, focused on a county? Is there a benefit to them being more closely aligned with each county? And I think they're talk um, uh, Carrie's talking about mobility managers. I think so too. Yeah, I can take that question. Um, thanks for asking, Carrie. Yeah, so um, traditionally what it was um, with our program was outreach in terms of education. And the mobility manager position that Heather was speaking about is a little more, a little more involved than that. And for us to kind of examine that, we, like Heather was saying, we are going to look at that within the next year to see if, you know, what, what would that look like? Um, if it does go to um, each county, wh what would that look like? Would there be a network? Um, one reason behind that would be the people involved in the counties. I'm going to use Ryan as an example. He's got this deep knowledge and information that maybe us as um, educators don't have. So knowledge of that county, of their funding, of the ins and outs of what will and won't work. Uh, so, you know, it, it might be a very good place to situate that position within each county so that we can kind of all pull together and create a more functional system. So hopefully that answers that question, but great question, Carrie. Yeah, this, um, this is Judy. I agree with you, Linda, in our work nationally. We have probably about half the states in this country have a mobility management network systemically throughout their state. And most of the mobility managers are regionally or county based because of those um, things that Linda just explain that they have the deep content knowledge of the area. They also have the trust of the community. They're a member of the community. So it, it works well to have those individuals located locally, but having a coordinator, having someone be that, um, the, that kind of overseer, not necessarily a supervisory role, but as a facilitator role, as a problem solving role. Um, next question comes from Dawn, um, and Dawn asks, do you have a list of organizations that provide bus transportation passes both in the city and suburban areas since we work with many um, 
disabled and homeless individuals. So is that an RTA question? List of organizations that provide bus transportation passes both in the city and suburbs. I am not aware of a list um, that is available. I think traditionally what has happened is organizations, if they are interested in getting um, uh, passes for their clients, they purchase those and then they hand them out as, um, you know, go per their regulation or, um, so as far as a list, I, I am not aware of one, so. Okay, maybe it's, um, you know, just ensuring that people that need passes know where to go. So that the, the, if an organization does purchase the passes to be able to give them to the people that they work with, at least the people in the community know that that's a mm -hmm. good resource mm -hmm. for passes, yeah, just for having sure. that information. So um, Esther is asking a question. She is very similar to Carrie's first question. Um, uh, how many, but how many low income communities, particularly those looking for employment, are unable to get to the suburbs from many parts of Chicago? So it looks like she's asking for people that may be employed in the suburbs um, from Chicago. So like a, re a reverse commute kind of situation. Heather, Audrey? Yeah, I can jump in on that. I mean, I, I'll, I'll say, yes, this is a problem. We, we know this is a problem and uh, it, it's, it's well known. So part one is, uh, you know, does the transit system um, provide access to some of the job centers in the suburbs? And many, you know, some of them do have Metro access, but many don't. And so um, that's a legacy, I think, of uh, over many years of suburbanization and employers moving out off, off of highways. Um, and I think, you know, a couple questions, uh, you know, come up for this. You know, how are there ways to solve this problem? One thing that my organization, the Metropolitan Planning Council, um, has looked into is, you know, this is not an easy problem to solve. Certainly, we, we want to see more jobs um, that are near transit. And overall, we are working collectively on transit-oriented development. But another way to look at it is, um, and I'm putting something in the chat, is uh, whether employers can play a role in solving some of these problems. Um, so we, this is a, the link I presented is a toolkit for employers to think about how they can support transportation. Um, with the new technologies out there, demand response vans. So, so this may be outside the transit system, um, but it could also be in combination with the transit system in terms of last mile um, types of services that uh, maybe employers are contributing to to make the trip from the end of the train line to the employer possible, which it wasn't otherwise. So I think um, there's a wide range of solutions and all of us have a role. Um, you know, it's not just the role of the transit system to solve these problems. I think it's the role of employers um, and that we all need to think creatively about how to solve these problems and, and long-term incentivize employers to locate near uh, inaccessible places as well. Yeah. Good, good point, Audrey. I'll um, vouch for Audrey's toolkit for employers. We've used it to um, help employers see the return on investment of um, in, in, uh, investing in transportation, that it's a heck of a lot cheaper uh, for them to, to pay for transportation supports in some way than it is to pay for the high cost of recruitment and turnover. And um, Audrey in that toolkit has a, um, a quantitative tool that you could use to actually look at the cost benefits of investing in transportation. It's a great tool. Hey, Judy, um, if I could just add to that real quickly. Please, that this is, yeah, the the whole the reverse commute getting from the city to the suburbs something is that the RTA has been tackling over the past few years by piloting some new um, mobility solutions, I'll call them, um, and that's partnering directly with the employers, as, as Audrey was mentioning as well. 
Um, some of them looking at how do you get, you, know, you can take the metro out so far, but then how do you get to your actual place of employment from there? And that's partnering with some different um, providers to actually um, provide a subsidized um, trip to actually get to that, that, that last, uh, the last mile or the final trip there. So that is something that we're actively looking at here at the RTA. Wonderful. Yeah, and on our website, by the way, we have um, some really great examples of employers who have been part of this mobility management coordinated framework and are contributing to transportation. So take a look. Um, another question from Carrie, she's asking about the ADA Title II self-analysis and transition plans for sidewalks, topic near and dear to my heart. Um, and um, she's asking whether the presenters were included in that process. And from your perspective, how can trans transition plans and the process in creating and updating them best interface with what you do? Audrey. Yeah, I'll take that one. Um, you are uh, right on the money to think about this. This was one of the recommendations of the Universal Mobility Plan that um, you know we needed to have a better understanding of the extent to which ADA transition plans exist in, in this region and are being implemented. Um, news flash preview, uh, my organization is going to be releasing a report in the next couple of months that's going to document which communities in our region have ADA transition plans and which don't. Um, and a preview, most don't. <laughs> so, um, you know, that was a requirement of ADA 30 years ago. And there's little enforcement. Frankly, that's that's, you know, no one's uh, penalizing them for not having them. Um, but we do believe that they would be extremely valuable because yes, while uh, communities know that they need to do ADA accessible construction when they're, you know, fixing a sidewalk uh, or, uh, you know, fixing a road or a crosswalk, uh, a lot of times that can wind up being a piecemeal situation. And uh, an ADA transition plan is gonna, uh, take a holistic look at the whole community and access to the key destinations throughout the community. And so we feel uh, that it's very important that this be an elevated, elevated as an important thing that communities should be doing. And then of course, uh, the connections to transit. Um, we all, all of us are very attentive to, you know, transit oriented development. Um, that only works if you have sidewalks that connect the buildings to the transit line. And so as we noted, um, there are a lot of places, particularly in the suburban areas where the sidewalks are not there. Now there's an added facet to this is that sidewalks are typically something that are uh, built by municipalities. Um, along an IDOT highway corridor, they, uh, they could be incorporated. Um, but they have historically had a local match requirement by IDOT. So we are hoping actually in this legislative session right now that that'll be reversed. So IDOT will pay 100% of the cost of sidewalks, which will make that more uh, easy for communities to do. But there's, there, there gets to be nuances of who's responsible, who pays for it, who maintains it, um, that can be challenging, but we need to work through. We need to get these, we need to get this stuff built. Yep, excellent. Thank you, Carrie. Anyone else want to respond to the ADA transition plan question? No. Um, I, if you notice that I, I talk about the work that we do as mobility, sometimes as opposed to transportation, because when I'm using that language, I'm supposing that the pathway, the path of travel, the, the right of way, all of that is part of a person's mobility. And you could have the best, best gosh darn transit system that there is. It could be so inclusive, but if people can't get there, it, it not worth a hill of beans. And so thinking about the, the connectedness, I think is exactly right. So thank you, Carrie, for asking that question. Um, no, another question is, um, do, does, does anyone on the um, panel know if um, Will County has any similar service as McRide that Mc McHenry has? I know um, Wendy Garlic is the mobility manager from Will County and she's on the line, but does any, Heather, Linda? Yeah, yeah, and you're, you're right. Will Ride is uh, the similar service that's on there in Will County. And I'm actually, I'm gonna drop there the website for that program into the, the chat here so you can access more details on that program. Wonderful. Wendy's an amazing 
person, was amazing mobility manager. So um, Julie's asking, can you speak a bit about your vision or possibilities for the mobility manager role as it applies or, and or interacts with HSAs? Heather, HSAs. Do we know what that is? You know, I, I, I think this is something that we're, we're looking into, as I mentioned, where, um, and Linda is actually leading this effort, is kind of investigating what um, this role that the mobility managers can play. And I think that's something we'll be, be looking into as part of that, um, that research that we're doing. Yeah, and to, to add on to that, uh, Julie, feel free to reach out to me if that's, um, I'm, I'm open to taking input because we really don't know at this point what um, what everybody is, uh, well, we want feedback basically. Um, so I'm, I'm open to a discussion if you'd like to reach out to me. No. On the next one. I was just, oh, go I was ahead. just gonna say, Judy, why don't you uh, tell, Judy is, uh, Judy has participated in many panels uh, about mobility management. So why don't you tell us a little bit like kind of what the national view is of what a mobility manager can be? Sure. Um, and just like transit, there is one, not one mobility manager, not one system looks like any other system, but essentially a mobility manager, and sometimes they have different titles. So a mobility coordinator, a transportation coordinator, but a mobility manager is someone that um, knows the needs of individuals with disabilities, knows how to acquire those needs through some systematic process, knows the services that may be available in a community and makes the match between those. And if there's not service, the mobility manager can help identify new service. They can work with partners to change service and redesign service. But it's a very customer-focused position. And uh, as I said earlier, we've done some state um, national studies, and I, I'd say about half of the states in our country have a network of mobility managers, and there are people that share information about transportation service and problem solving. And the ultimate outcome is so that individuals can access health care and access jobs and access community inclusive services so that people can live more vibrant, vibrantly in a community. And um, we have on our website, and it's all free, is we've got job descriptions from around the country. We've got examples of how mobility managers have worked with different organizations in their community. So, um, and we typically do webinars and we have blog posts that further provide examples. So what a great time that the RTA and Chicagoland is doing this because they could build on the work that's done nationally because we've learned a lot about what works and what doesn't work. And so um, they're receptive to um, listening to the input of the field and from what's been done in other places around the country. So um, I hope that Collectively, is, does anyone want to add anything about mobility management? Okay. Um, another question. What is the time frame like for getting a bus stop to be more accessible, such as the island bus stop? There, oh, very solid presentation. I like the variety. Thank you, Sully. Thank you. I concur with the panelists. Great job. Great job. <laughs> All right. Time frame for bus stop accessibility. Who can answer that? So I, yeah, this is Heather. Um, I think it depends on what you mean by the time frame. I, it's, you know, it's, it's a process that could happen quickly if you have some money on hand to take care of that infrastructure improvement, or it could be a little bit longer if there's some funding you need to seek out in terms of uh, grants funding. But I know this is something that is particularly important, the pace, uh, because they have so many of these situations out in the suburban areas where um, it's hard to get to that bus stop, even if it is there. And it's it's a it's kind of a web of uh, partnering with municipalities, partnering with the road agencies. Um, but it is definitely something that's top of mind, and that a lot of communities have really um, understood that this is an issue and trying to put more resources towards it. Um, so I'm I'm hoping over the the coming years you are going to see a lot of improvement, a lot of improvements in this area. But it's a um, it's, a, it's a deep problem and there's a lot of areas that still need um, fixing, so to say. 
Yeah, and I would just add, um, there is a new data set in the region that was created in the last couple of years by the uh, Chicago Metropolitan Agency for Planning. It's a walk, it's a sidewalk database. So for the first time, we now have a, a GIS map, which geographic information systems, so it's what a lot of planners use, that shows where sidewalks are in all six counties and whether they're on one side of the road or on both sides of the road. So now that's enabling us to do analysis um, around bus stops. As I, as I mentioned, my organization already did that around all the peace bus stops um, and showed that where there are deficits. So part of it is knowing where the problem is. And I think a lot of it is also, and that just got put in the chat, um, that link. A lot of it is also just speaking up. People have to speak up about how important walkability is for people being able to age in place, live in communities. Sidewalks are important for children for seniors, for people with disabilities, for people that want to be active, they're, they're, they're the most universal form of transportation. And uh, we don't prioritize them enough. So who makes the decisions about whether to fund these things? Uh, you know, elected officials and communities. And so I encourage all of you on the, on the event today as advocates, speak up and figure out who the decision makers are in your communities and, and ask for this um, this type of stuff because honestly the benefits are so high for the for the costs and and we can afford to do this and we should be doing it Great point, Audrey. The other thing um, is if you can make a connection between the impact of that bus stop and it being accessible to economy, what does it mean to jobs in the community because people can't get to jobs because the bus stop is bad? What does it mean to healthcare for community residents because that bus stop is close to a healthcare facility and they can't get to that facility? So the more you can make connections with the kinds of community issues that are important to diverse audiences. So healthcare providers, businesses, as Audrey said, the legislators in your local community, the, the, the people that are making the community planning people. So it's not just about a bus stop. It's about community and it's about a thriving community. So, um, Mark, yes, um, the National Center for Mobility Management is, um, I put the URL in the chat, and that's got tons of information about the competencies for mobility managers, examples of the connections. We've got examples of um, what these programs, what the components of mobility management are around the country. We do a lot of work to support the Federal Transit Administration around something called the Coordinating Council on Access and Mobility, we call it CCAM, and that's a federal effort to get all these 11 federal agencies that fund transportation or support transportation to be working together. So you'll see a lot of information on our website. We're also just um, announced we're having a series of webinars. Transit transportation has been so integral to um, the the um, ability of people to get tested for COVID and now to support access to vaccination sites. Some transit agencies around the country are even using their vehicles as a train as a vaccination site if people can't get there. They're also helping to transport um, healthcare providers to people's homes. So if people can't get out of their home, they're at least having access to a vaccine. So yeah, visit our site. My contact is information there and happy to provide it information as well. Another question. I lead a transit committee in my non-Chicago region. That's okay, you're non-Chicago. And sometimes it's challenging to get adequate participation from regional organizations. Do you have any advice for how to fuel active participation in the transit realm, especially for seniors and people with disabilities? Okay, yeah, I can handle some of this. I think Brian might have some ideas too, um, based on his committee. But uh, there's a couple of ways of looking at this. Uh, in order to engage, and this is what we do with our outreach, to engage groups that um, can use the information. One, uh, organizations, they're pretty, they're pretty busy. So you got to get to the person who's actually kind of in charge um, of that area. You also need to engage them in a conversation about um, what is important to them and to their clients. So 
Judy was just mentioning about vaccinate. How do I get to and from vaccinations? I'm sure everybody's wondering about that no matter where we are in the country. Uh, that might be one way to approach a senior organization or people with disabilities um, organizations, sponsored organizations, um, and say, hey, let's open up a discussion. Even if you don't have a solution to it, let's open up this discussion. Can you participate in this? So there's got to kind of be this carrot on the stick. Um, there's got to be something useful for them. So you got to find, <laughs> you got to find out what what information they want, need, or their their clients want and need and um, approach it from that. And I know Ryan leads a, a pretty robust committee out in um, McHenry County. So maybe he has some additional things to add to that. Sure, so yeah, to add to what Judy's saying, um, a lot of times you have to meet them where they're at as well. So go to their senior care facilities, go to their already existing committees um, and invite them to yours as well so that um, you're understanding what their needs are for their groups but then you know, show them how your committees can help them as well. Um, the second tip I would say is uh, get as much information out there and make it as, as accessible and easy to access as possible. Uh, so you know, digital, uh, hard copies, anything you can do to advertise and market uh, your programs to make sure that people know about them is gonna be very helpful and it's gonna increase your ridership. Um, and I guess that would be about it. Great suggestions. You know, um, also highlighting them as a participant in an advisory capacity, highlighting their contributions to so problem solving and figuring out how to address the mobility challenges in a community is really um, another way to engage people. And Linda, we call that the very technical term of finding the hook. You know, what's the ROI for me to participate and contribute my time? Everyone's time is valuable. And so how, how can I make it meaningful for me and the people that I work with or the people that I serve. So um, we have just a couple minutes left. I'll, I'll give our, our amazing panelists a minute or two to offer any closing thoughts. Heather, want to start? Any final thoughts as we move forward? Yeah. And knowing this is just the beginning. Yeah, I guess final thoughts. One is just really want to spread the word that we do have this call for projects opening. Um, on March 22nd, and um, I think this is one of the biggest tools that we have to implement the recommendations from the HSTP plan. Wonderful, thank you. Um, Audrey? Yeah, I would encourage everyone to take, take a look at the HSTP plan and uh, let's all figure out how we can be part of the solution and, and collaborate. Um, we were very, MPC was very pleased to see how much alignment there was with our universal mobility plan and the HSTP plan. What that means is that we, we have figured out what we need to do um, that through these, these processes. So uh, now doing it isn't gonna be easy necessarily, but um, if we are willing to collaborate um, on a higher you know, order than has historically happened, um, I think we can get a lot done uh, now that we know what we need to do. So I'm excited about um, the potential to, to make things better. Thank you, Audrey. Ryan, I'll let you hit third this time. <laughs> Thank you, Judy. Um, a lot of great points have been brought up today. Um, no real closing comments, but on behalf of McHenry County, I uh, wanna thank the RTA for having us um, here to present today uh, and to share the story of MC Ride. So thank you so much. Wonderful, thank you, Ryan and Linda. Yeah, so I was, I was listening to everybody and seeing this as like a, a giant puzzle, I guess. And uh, we have this tiny role of, you know, we're mobility, we're, regional mobility outreach coordinators, but we only have this tiny little puzzle piece, but we, we are a little piece. And I guess I would just encourage everybody to take their own, look at what your piece is and um, really put that out there. Um, even if you think it's something small, people need information and uh, it's great that we're all kind of pulling this all together. 
Great, great analogy. It's a puzzle and we're putting the pieces together. And I could assure you, once we get all the pieces together, they're probably going to get all messed up and we'll have to do it again, even better and bigger. So um, thank you all for uh, participating today. Um, the RTA has amazing resources and um, different ways to stay connected. And I'm sure any of our panelists, they've all provided their contact information, would be happy to provide any follow-up if you have. Um, look out for the survey the evaluation that's going to be sent to you, that information about um, your perceptions of this webinar and, and needs and topics is really critical. So um, thank you, panelists. I get to hold up my great sign, my great job sign once more. I, I didn't even have to use this sign. You're on mute. I have two now. So um, thank you for your time. Thank you for your great work. And I look forward to working with all of you. And thank you, participants, for um, being engaged. Everyone have a, a safe and uh, wonderful day. Thank you.